when he saw oppression within the communities, even before Islam, even before he became a prophet, he joined a group of people to pledge to bring about justice for each and every individual. So, as human beings, we strive to achieve justice. So we should all live with justice. We should demand justice. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, as quoted uh, Martin Luther King Jr. So we are very fortunate to have uh, Mr. Dennis Edney. We know his great work, his tireless efforts, and some of you may not know this, but he has dedicated his personal finances to fight this journey of justice. And we are making an appeal. I was speaking to uh, Mr. Dennis Edney earlier, and he mentioned that throughout this journey many times he felt alone. He felt that there's no one there. So this is an event to acknowledge his great work. This is an event to let him know that he is not alone. We are all supporting him on his great work, and we have to put our money where our mouth is. He has rendered many travels. He has taken out of his personal expenses to take care of the issues at hand. And this is putting aside all the legal fees, etc. So as the Muslim community, we support this great work and we are appealing that each and every one of you contribute towards this cause and he is able to take care of the expenses and meet the challenges that are before him on this journey of justice. So there is a verse in the Quran that speaks about where we can spend our zakah, our charity, etc. And this verse also points out that those who are unlawfully imprisoned, those who are unlawfully imprisoned, you can spend your charity to assist them getting out of the prison. So this is exactly what the work that Mr. Dennis Edney is doing. An earnest appeal is made to each and every one of you. There will be tables set up and the uh, speakers after me will let you know how you can contribute towards uh, the work of Mr. Dennis Edney through your zakat, through your sadaqah, your charity, etc. in different formats. And uh, once again, we thank all of you for coming out. And at this point, I am inviting Mr. Brother Waris Malik to come to the podium. He's one of the organizers of this event and uh, he is also a pillar of our community and he has been in contact with uh, Mr. Dennis and me throughout the journey and uh, inshallah he will welcome uh, all of you again and he will also introduce uh, Mr. Dennis and me. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you with the universal reading of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. May the peace and blessing of Almighty God be upon you. We are here today to reflect on two very important aspects of our society. One is the advancement of good and other on a universal virtue of justice. On the advancement of good, our religion is quite clear as to the rights that our neighbors and community have on us and how it is actually an obligatory duty on each one of us to ensure that his or her neighbor does not even go to bed hungry. An obligation that quite obviously goes beyond the bounds of nutrition in its scope and spirit. By following this simple social guideline outlined to us in our faith, we could not only achieve a stronger bond with the people within our community, but also help them understand the wisdom of faith also achieve success, successful social multi-faith coexistence. Our religion and equally humanity expects more from us in dealing with our existence, existing social environment, and it is necessary to allocate and contribute more efforts towards this goal. Let me remind myself first, and then all of you as well, that good must be supported wherever it is found. On the important topic of justice, we have to ask ourselves, why is it that the weak and oppressed people of the world feel as if the virtue of justice has been suspended? How is it that we can write in our constitutions, international treaties, some of the loftiest ideals of justice, equality, 
fairness and dignity for all of the mankind and then sit by and allow powerful, wealthy, tyrant leaders of all stripes, colors and creed to trample upon these ideas time after time. Justice is an important virtue in our faith. The Quranic chapter titled Nisa, which means woman, in the verse 58, God Almighty commands us, if you judge or make a ruling in a dispute between people, be just. In the very same chapter, God tells us that we should stand up for justice, be a witness for God, even though it will be against ourselves. Every Friday, during our sermons, every Imam, wherever he is, will recite from the pulpit. Really, God enjoins upon us justice and kindness and giving to others for bearing hatred, evil and wickedness. Allah encourages us so that we become better people. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope we will live today with a new commitment of justice within our own lives, at home, and in our own communities. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Mr. Dennis Edney. You must have seen Mr. Edney many times on TV, heard him on the radio, and even read his quotes on the newspaper. Dennis is an incredible and remarkable person, and a very special friend. Mr. Edney came all the way from Alberta to be amongst people like yourself, who believe and stand up and support the just cause, and have eagerness to join the journey of justice. He has spent from his personal savings and funds in the hope that justice will be served. It is important to know that his wife, Patricia, and both sons have supported him and always stood beside him. That alone says a lot about this man's care and concern for Umar Khadr and his passion for justice. Difficult cases are not something that he shies away from. In the last few years, he has appeared at every level of our legal system, all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. In this journey of justice, Mr. Edney has spent his own funds, time, resources, and I would say everything. He has been doing this to this day, as he believed in what I said before, that good must be supported wherever it is found, and one should stand up for justice and just causes. Ladies and gentlemen, can I request all of you to kindly stand up. Because it is an accepted fact 
that the one who today faces grave challenges to the rule of law and to human rights. Previously well established and accepted legal principles are now being called into question in all regions of the world through what I would suggest are ill conceived responses to terrorism. Many of the achievements in the legal protection of human rights are under attack. Now, terrorism poses a serious threat to human rights. I acknowledge that. However, since September of 2001, many countries have adopted new counter-terrorism measures that are in breach of their international obligations. In some countries, the post-September 2001 climate of insecurity and fear has been exploited to justify long-standing human rights violations carried out in the name of national security. In adopting measures aimed at suppressing acts of terrorism, countries such as Canada, the United States and others must adhere strictly to the rule of law, including the core principles of criminal and international law and the specific standards and obligations of international human rights law, refugee law, and where applicable humanitarian law. However, it is not simply a utilitarian calculation of balancing the right to the security of the many against the legal rights of the few. In combating terrorism, we are fighting for more than the safety of our citizens, though that is an important objective. We are also fighting for the preservation of our democratic way of life, our right to freedom of thought and expression, and our commitment to the rule of law. Those liberties which have been had upon over the centuries and which we should hold dear. So what am I saying? In my view, defeating terrorism means convincing the world of the importance of following the rule of law. And we must, must be alert to the extent to which governments, including our own government, continues to exploit us by using the fear power of security trumping the civil liberties. You know, recently, the Canadian government passed Bill C-51 to allow more extensive surveillance of its citizens by its intelligence agency and CSIS. The government is seeing the problem this way. If judges, Canadian judges, have restrained the agency's powers in the name of preserving liberties, this was a clear attack on civil liberties being put aside provide more extensive surveillance of you and I in the name of security. And I can tell you that there's no group more surveilled than Muslims from one end of Canada to the other. So I don't know how much more surveillance powers they need. But it's significant that the, the government puts in a balance between more surveillance versus less civil liberties. That is the fear. And that was the same language used by the Bush administration in setting out its most national defense strategy in 2005. I spent many years in the States as I went back and forth to Guantanamo Bay. And I'm very familiar with the Bush language. And, and Bush won when he attacked civil liberties, what he said was, our strength as an American nation will continue to be challenged by those who employ a strategy of the weak by using international media 
and judicial process. So Bush clinches in terms of compliance and media um, talking access to the courts shows weakness in the face of terrorism. And in Britain, Prime Minister Tony Blair on the point of leaving office, he said, you know, it's a dangerous misjudgment to put civil liberties first. And to do so, in his view, was misguided and wrong. It's fascinating, these three powerful individuals, Bush, Harper, and Tony Blair, are fighting for civil liberties. And I say to you, it is to our judiciary we must come to when we seek protection of our fundamental rights and our freedoms. Our courts must be the guarantor of human rights and the fight against terrorism. And to those who wish to suspend our civil liberties, they could benefit from listening to the wise words of, of the of former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Brennan, who in 1997 declined past history the suspension of civil liberties. He said, there is considerably less to be proud about and a good deal to be embarrassed about when one reflects on the shabby treatment civil liberties have received in the United States during times of war and perceived threats to national security. And after each perceived security crisis ended, the United States has remorsefully realized that the abrogation of civil liberties is simply unnecessary. But it has proven unable to prevent itself from repeating the same error when the next crisis comes along. So I say to you in our commitment to the rule of law, we cannot compromise on long-standing principles of justice and liberty. We are, we are confronted every day with the language of fear. Every day, the phrase the war on terror and the word terrorist has now become synonymous with Islam and Muslim in the minds of many. And in news, as a result of that, it is easy for people to accept that drastic measures must be taken in the interest of security. Even if it means the suspension of civil liberties, compromising our values, or ignoring the rule of law, because we simply rationalize this for the greater good of society. And as you're aware, after 9-11, Muslims in the United States were rounded up and incarcerated without access to lawyers or their loved ones. Since then, Muslims have been made to pay a terrible price for the actions of 19 fanatics who in no way represented Islam or its values. Afghanistan and Iraq were bombed and invaded as a direct consequence of 9-11. Over a million men and women and children have been killed in those countries. Untold number of men, widowed, and orphans. And I say to you that one has to look no further than the story of Guantanamo Bay to understand how easy it is for a nation to fall into lawlessness. It was in January. 2002, the many of us here today witnessed on various media outlets the first shocking images of the teens being hooded and shackled for transportation across the Atlantic to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Much as other human beings had been carried in slave ships 400 years earlier. And prior to their departure, they were deprived of food and water to ensure that they did not access 
Tower facilities on the plane. I met the home on that to bring that to my attention. So, Mr. Redman, the police have put on this plane to go to Guantanamo Bay. We only get little sips of water and no food for three days. And you have seen the, the images of the detainees in all the jumpsuits who were made through a shock shackle and then made to lie on the floor of these planes or in a fetal position or squatting for the 24 hour long trip to Guantanamo Bay. And I have been in those planes and I've been able to go to sleep. And they are most of them burn themselves and die. I can't imagine what it would be like to be lying on the floor in those positions for 24 hours. And of course, while they're shackled in those planes, their eyes and ears are covered with goggles with their heads covered by a dark hood. The message, of course, is that these are the human beings. And that is evident by the time you get to Guantanamo, they are unloaded on the tarmac like so much baggage to be lifted and transported to wire cages that are approximately about six feet by six foot seven that will be their home for many years, regardless of the weather, whether it's a tropical storm, or where we see it here. Now imagine giving your pet that way. It wouldn't be long before you come before a court and charge with cruelty. My dogs, I have two lamb dogs. They have far more freedom and far better treatment than these human beings, these detainees, these Muslim detainees in Guantanamo. And, and be very clear, Guantanamo is not for a white occasion. A serial killer on the streets of New York doesn't go to Guantanamo Bay. Guantanamo Bay is for Muslims. And for the watching world, no knowledge of international humanitarian conventions was needed to understand that what each one of us was witnessing on the television was simply unlawful. This was not a manifestation of the Geneva Conventions, nor was it an act of deportation or extradition. It was far, far worse. It was the unlawful transportation to a, world, to a world outside the reach of the law and intended to remain so and continues to do so to this present day. And in that, in that world, crimes against inhumanity got to be carried out in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And amongst those detainees was a young 15-year-old Canadian, Omar Khadr, abandoned in Guantanamo Bay by a government when every Western government requested and was granted the return of their citizens, adults everyone. We left the chance, we had the opportunity take a child out of that hellhole of Guantanamo and bring him home, as Britain did, France did, Germany did, all the Western countries. And he chose not to. He chose just to leave him there. And the message that was given to the Americans was, we don't care, do what you want with him. And do what you want with him was the bastard. place, we witnessed videotapes of a young Canadian boy, Omar Kader, crying out for his mother. After 10 Canadian interviews, he had been tortured and was frightened of the Americans. It took me five years of fighting to get that videotape of Kader's involvement in Guantanamo Bay. And when I put it before the Supreme Court of Canada and I before the Supreme Court of Canada was released. The court ruled that Canada had been complicit in the torture of Omar Khan along with the CIA. Imagine your own country being involved in the torture of a child. And 
Pentecost, when that video was distributed to the media, and I got up the next day, I expected, I don't know what I said, but what I got was silent. The world didn't change. People in my office didn't say, great son, no calls, no calls from ministers or demands, human rights organizations, my neighbors. We didn't care. And we still don't talk about it. We don't talk about the fact that one of the children was abused and tortured in Guantanamo by our own government, which was then the Liberal government. And in his 10 years in Guantanamo, Omar had been subject to a smorgasbord border of abuse. From waterboarding to being strung up in a crucifixion pose. The crucifixion pose, every, most detainees, and if not every detainee, has at this time experienced. Whatever torture that Omar experienced, others in Guantanamo have given the same treatment. No need for opportunity in Florida in Guantanamo. <laughs> I, I recall a nurse from the Bagram Hospital, which I realized was a torture chamber, where Muslims died, Muslims were crippled, and somehow all Muslims survived. And she said, I never saw any of them. There was nothing. Nothing that I saw, there was nobody here. And yet, we had a soldier who said, you know, I saw Omar Khan on, on a screen, stretched out, tied to the screen with wire mesh, crying, screaming, in pain, particularly when his body has suffered such terrible wounds. And these torturers, what do they do? These evil men. And evil's not a word that I use very much. But I use it when I talk about my town. And all my cattle had to be. And he had a great time. Because then he'd take him down and he'd use his head as a mop to pick up the urine. What kind of man are these? And what kind of people are allowed that to happen? And whatever was going on in Guantanamo, international countries do that. That's why Germany, Britain, France, all of them, they demanded that their citizens get out of that hellhole because it was beyond the rule of law. The civil liberties were just a fiction. Meanwhile, I remember Peter McKay saying to the media, we've been assured by the Americans that we've been treated well. And he said that in the face of overwhelming information by other international countries. And of course, Omar, like others, was subject to prolonged sensory deprivation and profound long term isolation. The interrogator of Omar Khadr in Bangor. And, and, to, and it's Omar's confessions to Joshua Claus that they relied upon. And dear old Joshua, he was convicted by the military a year later for killing one detainee and crippling two others using the same techniques that he used against Omar Khan. I know that. It's the public record in the government knows that. And yet the government continues to talk about it's uh, the due process. Omar Khadr was doing due process in Guantanamo. There's not such a word as due process in Guantanamo. There's a place that's beyond the rule of law, and there's a place that's evil. And in that hellish place of Guantanamo, while we're talking, it's a, it, it is a common sight, certainly for me, having gone there for years. To observe a detainee, shot shackled, wearing black goggles, and earmuffs to block out all light as he's been taken away for an interrogation session. Multiple interrogation 
sessions were taking place by each and every detainee. And I know where he was going, and he knew where he was going. He was going to be tortured. Mr. Potts of the everyday life in Guantanamo. And in that hellish place, many of those detainees who were brought to Guantanamo, they arrived as young men, and after years of isolation and abuse, simply became old men. Guantanamo is a place shut off from the rest of the world, forgotten and abandoned by all of us. With the exception of a half dozen detainees, the remainder of the 800 detainees have never been charged with any crime, provided with any evidence of having committed a crime, have never been provided access to a lawyer, to a cause for a visit, a human rights visit. And the memory of their families and their children has become a distant image. They are simply lost in that black hole of Montana Bay. And hundreds and hundreds of them have been secreted out quietly over the years, which puts lie to the statement by Dick Cheney that these are the worst of the worst. Common sense would tell you that if you were under it tonight, if you received such international condemnation of the place as a torture center, you would have put all the bad, bad, terrible, evil people up on a stand and let the world see why we need to suspend you with civil liberties and why we need to lock these men away. The fact that they don't do that is terrible. I so I remember at some point realizing that this trial for all man was not going to work. You know, I can tell you that in my lifetime, I remember my mother scolded me at times and said, You should be ashamed of yourself. So I'm not really sure what it was I did, but I'm sure she was right. But I've never been ashamed of myself as a lawyer until I participated in that kangaroo court called Guantanamo Bay. I arranged for all types of international witnesses to come to Guantanamo Bay to give evidence. And the work of our men. Omar Kelly had no witnesses. Tortured evidence, or evidence of being tortured was not permitted in man. It was just a fake trial. And your government knows that because they had representatives present. And so I recall persuading Omar to take somehow or other out of the blue, there was an opportunity to do a plea bargain. Hillary Clinton had become personally involved. And I remember trying to persuade Omar, let's do this. And he didn't want to do a plea bargain. Because what he said was, Canadians will view me as a terrorist. And he was prepared to stay in Guantanamo for the rest of his life than be viewed as a terrorist by his own people. And I relentlessly persuaded him to be pleading guilty. You have to be guilty. You will never get out of here. And what I said to him was, the Canadian public, they'll understand your situation. And when they get to see you, they'll know who you are. Except I had realized the Canadian government would not allow Omar to be seen by the Canadian. The Canadian government would not allow Omar to be seen by the Canadian public. They would not allow him to be interviewed. The only message that you were going to hear was this young man committed a heinous crime and was a terrorist. And the shocker is, he's now out in the streets. And people from one end of Canada and the other have written to me about how happy I've had over a thousand emails. And 
not current in Wales, I'm just talking to England. But people, Canadians, say a number of things. Thank you. And two, we feel better as Canadians with an art. And in my time, in all my walks in the street, every so often someone will stop, not very intrusive, and say, welcome. Last week I was in a store with him and this bruiser, old good guy, walked up to him and said to him, you know, I don't like Americans. I don't like what they did to you. And you deserve a great life. And then walked away. I live in a highly Jewish area. My neighbors, my have you ever seen? We've had three different families sent flowers, two different families sent, sent bakery. We've had neighbors knock on the door, personal welcome home out. And when you watch that press conference, you heard voices shouting, welcome home out. That was my neighbors. But before he arrived there, he obviously had to put up with various community prisons. And in preparing for his transfer to Canada, Canada, I provided all kinds of documents from the, from the Pentagon to a judge advocate who was in charge of, of Guantanamo Bay to a psychiatric evaluation, a psychological evaluation, and so on. And reports from the Department of Foreign Affairs officials who every so often go to Guantanamo. And every one of those reports, every single one of those reports, talked about him being a good kid before. He had no idea what to be. He was strong in his faith, led prayers in Guantanamo. So, what does our former minister of taste in? He declares him on his arrival as a, as a security risk in Canada, and better still, a security risk than any other prisoner in a, one of our master prisoners in Canada. And so, welcome to Canada. We lock him for the first seven and a half months in solitary confinement. And on his release, the very day of his release, he put him on a food line to have a, one single piece of butter as his instruction to the various prisoners, serious prisoners, killed. And here's this innocent young man saying to a well seasoned criminal that you can only have one piece of butter, and that's viewed as an insult. And so he tries to stab Omar, puts a contract on him, and eventually we're able to get him to go be transferred to Alberta. And then what do we do in Alberta? When we put a white with a Muslim boy? Well, of course, we put him on a white supremacist unit when he gets beaten up within the first five minutes. But there are good stories to The people in the prison of New Haven and the authorities in the prison in Edmonton all realized that he didn't want it. And they wanted to get him out and they wanted to get him out of these places as quickly as possible. Even guards with the smell test, as I do as a criminal lawyer, whether you're really a serious player or not. They were worried. He just didn't fit. So, history tells us that there are some cases that enshrine the defining moments of the time. Omar Khabib's case is one. Future generations will rightly judge our shocking dereliction of responsibility in this matter and our collective failure to extend justice and humanity. 
And as we have failed Omar, we've also, also failed our children through bequeathing to them an uncertain future as a result of this systemic apathy by our Canadian citizens and our civil institutions. We have all participated in abandonment. An old last story I suggest to you provides a frightening lens into the future of democracy and the decline of the rule of law as they once knew. The story of Omar Khan is not just about a young boy who was detained and, detained and abused. His story is also about how we as individuals define ourselves as a society and what each one of us is prepared to stand up for us. Because if we walk away from our duty to uphold civil liberties, human rights, human values, then who's going to speak for you and us? When our time comes. And so as I conclude, I should tell you, Omar Khan is doing well. You saw the pure honesty of him when he gave the press conference. Absolute pure honesty. People from one end of Canada to the other saw a different person than what they thought of him. He's been, he's shown what many, I don't know, many, but what others can do. That he can survive the hell and become more human. My experience with torture victims is the last thing they want to do is get a gun and get revenge. What they, and it's, it's very difficult to understand. What I've noticed is they become more human. I recall years ago saying to Omar, what do you want to do when we get you out of Montana? Just to kill time. And he said, I wish to be a doctor. And I said, why? He said, because I wish to make sure that no one is ever treated like me. He, like others, don't wish to to have you suffer pain. He is so compassionate and humanity to you and I in a hellhole of our time while we forgot about it. Thank you.
and you know, very kind and honest him and gave us facts at that time. And we are very thankful and thankful for him to him it is also that he came again and he shared how this journey is going till today. So if you have any questions, I will open the floor right now for a few minutes and if you have any questions, then will be most more happy to answer those questions. Pivot a bit from international politics to um, the local scene in in um, Toronto. And in Toronto here, we have a situation where black and brown youth are targeted by the police. And I'm just going to assume that you're familiar with it. And um, is this the type of case that you think should be fought in the court of law, similar to what you did? And if so. Is this the type of case that you would um, represent? I know the situation. I believe in it. I, I, first of all, I'll tell you, I would take the case on. I'm busy enough. I'm getting tired. <laughs> but you know, I'd like to, to students everywhere, people everywhere. And I always tell them, I'm really a powerful guy. I used to start off by saying, look at his body. And the kids would look at me and went, what? <laughs> but I am a powerful guy. Why? Because it's hard to defeat my arguments when I'm talking about justice and human dignity. Come. And, and where do I fight? I fight in the court of law. That's where I look for my answers. The fact that I've been successful against every challenge by this government in all the many years is less about myself and my co-counsel being with me, and more about the strength of our judiciary. And so, of course, I, it stuns me that no one has ever gone to court to challenge them. And that's perhaps what your bosses and other groups should have. You should you should law as a powerful tool. You may not be a lawyer, but you certainly have many lawyers and who are, who are part of your community. And you should put groups together in your mosques to fight for your reputation, to fight wherever the sea of justice. That's truly setting a good example to our kids that we can be protected. I may have said to you that just recently some friend of mine, a Muslim friend, told me that his boy wished to change his Muslim name. That stunned me because kids don't want to be picked out and obviously he would be singled out because of what? Because he had a Muslim name. We've allowed, we have unchallenged for so many years now. You've been apathetic. And it's time to take, take that back to this answer. Anybody express else? Express the deep gratitude that all of us feel for you uh, and because of the work that you have done. You have fought the unjust cause and you have done it at great sacrifice to yourself. We have a, a Prime Minister who is bereft of the quality of mercy, and I want to tell you thank you from all the people that I know I represent. <laughs> Couldn't see me. 
and so he had he had been operated, was operated on and a cataract was removed. So his vision is better. His problem is of course that he has shrapnel in his good eye. And we I took him to the hospital for some testing just last week. And we're waiting for the results and, and experts to tell us what they think. Um, I, my view is a naive view perhaps, but I believe the doctors are pretty scared of going in there and taking out that shrapnel because they can do because any mistake and you can kill the life. Um, so but his health is better. Oh, and in terms of government, well of course not. He's in my house. He's part of my family while he's away from his real family. And uh, we'll take care.
I'm not going to repeat them. In fact, I don't, although I made this comment, this is not the last question, but, but um, although I made those comments, my next time will be a bit more toned down. Why? Because someone said to me, we Canadians don't like that type of new face and dialogue. And then he said, here, let me express to you how Canadians are like through my mother. My mother, he said, said to him, I was so angry at that person that I almost said something. Stand up here to tell you I'm tired, to tell you many things. But if you said to me, would you do it again? My answer would be, of course not. There, there's a beauty and a satisfaction in helping people and being committed to justice. I, 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 I'm not a Protestant Christian, but I do believe, I do believe in justice is human. Justice is, and Muslims particularly, are, 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 they live that kind of thing. And so I, I have become a much more human person, a much happier person than myself. I know mean, what I always say at the end of the day when you're sitting in a park bench. It's not your big house and your car you're talking about. It's how you feel about what you contribute to every day in society. And so I, I've been given the gift of being able to contribute for the lifestyle of a lost soul in an evil place called Montana. I'm so delighted when I see him take off on his bike down a path, it's so symbolic of freedom. I'm so pleased that I have spent, that I have spent time being able to do something. So as a human being, I become much better.
Go ahead. He's going to beat yourself, of course. <laughs> um, so I'm speaking to a Muslim audience. It's a essentially. I know it's rich, but this is, this, uh, this, this is uh, essentially a Muslim audience. And I speak to I speak German, but I'm just speaking to something. So long as you understand, and so long as you have belief in human rights, in compassion, in respect of your neighbor, uh, and that is a kind of virtue, then it's much harder to be caught up in making self certain uh, choices that. It's okay to lock people up because they have a trial, because they're, they're potentially terrorists. You claim, but by that belief in justice, you then have a standard on which everything you do is, is tested. And so you're able to see through the manipulation of governments when you use language to do the things you don't want to do. We, I, in Winnipeg, in the next couple of weeks, there's a conference on championship of people in this First World War, Second World War, and Games War, and all for different reasons. And so it's understanding that history, that how we use fear constantly to make you so frightened of your anger. And so you have to educate yourself, and you have to embrace yourself in your own community, so you don't feel you're alone. So other people can help you with your wisdom. Well, I asked my wife um, last night how he was doing, and she said, I can't get him off the bike. <laughs> is I'm a for education. And I use that word, because I've never met anybody who, I know I was a Christian. He just loves learning. And so he's in the summer class. And so that's big for him. What's next in all my character is, is to take time to adjust to society. He, he is, he, as I think I've said, he is a wonderful example of coming out of hell. But at some point in time, you have to face some of the nightmares that he's probably stolen away somewhere. And so, it, uh, it's a slow journey. And what, what, what we are we trying to do is we're trying to surround the love. Love, love, love. Society in a different direction. 
and what we are not. Learn how to commit yourself, to how to commit justice. It's something ridiculous. I have to say this from this point, but it's true. You are the new leaders, and you have to decide what kind of world you want, because the world we've given you is a bit of a mess.
So who knows? All I know is we just keep on doing what we're doing. And now we have an opportunity to allow him to get the kind of freedom, the kind of development, and he's out of the bottom. And what does he represent? He represents so much to Muslims. This, but this is the worst of the worst that a government and America is trying to control. That's how important. You know, that's the message. Last big question. of hand-picked soldiers by some miracle agreed that he was innocent. <coughs> the fact that he was still in indefinitely in America has been definitely in one time when he was still on the team. That is how it works. In fact, there is a there is a um, Former, um, former officer who was in charge of Guantanamo Bay, the chief prosecutor, who said the, the idea of Guantanamo Bay is that you want to get free, you have to be guilty. You have to be guilty. But in death detention, we have Obama talks about death detention. There are people in Guantanamo who will never get out because they've been told they're doing death goes against every single ethical principle of law. I 
why don't we focus on the joy? And, and, and I'm not picking on it, please. Why focus on the good? Is that, is that I, of course, I've done great jobs year after year after year of upholding his rights. Canadians have said overwhelmingly to me, and thank goodness, other roads have seen negative things, of course. I don't go into social media. You won't find me on social media. And I'm sure you'll find some negative, ignorant individuals who will talk about all my car, or will talk about the whale, or will talk about whatever, but have negative viewpoints. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in focusing on what we can do and the good we can do. Thanks.
Uh, listen, first of all, I want to thank you, but I also want to thank uh, our community members who supported the, the Qatar family, because again, that was amazing. I mean, really, um, this family has been through a lot. They were on the front lines for the longest time. This was the guys leading the pack, helping them to overcome their challenges and whatever have you. I mean, come on, let's just give it up for them. As a youth, you've got into big issues. And our youth, even today in our community, right here in Toronto, are getting into big issues. There's more stuff happening, the laws are changing, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's coming on, and we're acting like nothing is wrong and nothing, everything is okay. Uh, could you please speak to that? Because we need youth counseling, and we need to get on top of this, because we don't have sufficient activities and processes in place to be able to handle what's going on. We can barely deal with these guys. And most people didn't want to deal with them. Okay, but the reality is more coming. Please tell them. They're not listening to us. Please tell them. Thank you. You're sending my bill? I got the receipt right here, buddy. You know, I, I don't want to get to politics too much, but, uh, but, but very clearly, uh, we have government that I don't believe. As we say, you have to believe what I'm saying to you. But you know, we, we, we're, trying to sh we're trying to show them tough on everything, tough on crime. Well, the crime rate has been going down for the last 13 years. The murder rate has been going down. I have friends who talk about it. Talk about how things are terrible. And I asked them, when was the last time your house was open? Someone robbed you in the street. Blah, blah, blah. Just happened to be here. You know, the vast, the vast majority of people to go about the business safely in the day. We have terrorism. We had the enforcement of the city. The soldier who was shot in power, or a guy who was outside of power. But what did this mother say? Mother said, my son was an addict. I met him in slavery. I had a mother and father who came to me and I would care for her to say that. And they said, my son's always been in trouble. He's a young guy. He's very young. And he's always doing silly things. He wants to join the foreign legion. And then the police have sent out a message. They just call us. We'll be there for you. So she called him and they charged him. Charged a boy with attention to the city. Uh, so the governments are not there to help us, but we're, we're more and more in an era that might be of uh, the Bush administration. Fear, 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 because they're in the uh, and, and, and in there we have, coming back to youth, we have youth who are lost. <coughs> I know that because I have a teenage boy. I always, I always describe teenage kids as great you know? <laughs> But my boy, Ducky, the last time he got into trouble was he climbed up onto a roof two stories high and a ski off. <laughs> you know? uh, they need help. <laughs> I need help in many different ways. We see children every day. You see it in real life. We bypass them. We, 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 we are part of that collective, you know. We're all part of the same society. We're all the same, irrespective of color. We have to be reaching out. We have to talk to the schools. How can I help? I don't have no answers. All I know is that we can make a better world if we participate and we assist those who are trying to do the right one. Thank you. You have to support them also. You can't just listen and go away. That's, that's not how it should be. He has been fighting this case, as he said, for the last 10 years. Imagine a lawyer fighting a case for 10 years not doing his client. It's, it's hard to believe how that lawyer can survive. So you have to realize all this thing. 
You have set up a table that if you want to support. If you don't want to support today, please call in or email him and tell him how you want to support. It's an obligation for us based on our charter, based on our religion, based on our everything. That we have to leave this world better for our children. No matter what. We can't leave them in a mess. If we don't act today, then it's up to you. Thank you very much.